thank you for uh, for waking up Saturday morning seven. Not easy. Thank you for your commitment. Thank you for your interest in uh, in Eagle High. Um, this morning, uh, I believe we've got a very exciting uh, uh, program for you. Um, first of all, um, Dr. Jason Jetlicka will uh, he's done extensive research with the eye surface profiler and, and fitting uh, scleral lenses, in lenses in particular, and he will he will talk about his experiences. So we're uh, we're very thrilled to have him, and uh, and also uh, Dr. Karen Carasquillo from Boston Sites. Um, she has done a lot of research as well, or uh, the, the team at Boston Site has done a lot of research as well on uh, fitting their uh, spherules, uh, the spheral device, the pros, and uh, the Boston Site spheral. And uh, she's going to present on her experiences uh, with uh, fitting them with the eye surface profile. So, um, with a great pleasure, I, I hand over to, uh, to Dr. Jason Jetica. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. A tough morning to be up early, but it's great to see a good group here. So, Karen and I are going to just share some of our experiences with using the Eye Surface Profiler, not only to obtain scleral profile data, but then to use the software that's built in to design lenses. And I just want to go through and show you our outcomes so you can feel confident that the data that's obtained that's used to create lenses is good data and give them good lens outcomes. First of all, for, for all of us who fit sclerals, you realize that the process of fitting a scleral is fairly straightforward. We talk about this one, two, three approach. We simply just vault the central cornea, we clear the limbus, and we align the sclera. And what sets a novice fitter apart from an expert typically is the ability to get that peripheral fit right. That's the challenge. We know that the sclera is highly irregular and, and often quite toric, and to be able to to visualize that shape and to describe a lens that is uh, geared to fit that eye properly, provide good comfort, uh, long-term wear and stability, avoiding fogging and things like that. Um, that's really what the experience of fitting sclerals allows us to do. Um, so, but is there a way that, you know, short of having 10 years of experience fitting sclerals to finally understand how to fit that properly, can we use the technology to get there a lot quicker? And so, of course, sterile topography has changed everything. This is probably about the hundredth time I've said this this week, but if you think about the idea of trying to fit a corneal gas perm lens with no corneal data at all, no K readings, no nothing, just a complete shot in the dark, grabbing a lens and putting it on the eye, how often are you going to be right? How often are you going to be close? Okay? And yet that's our approach to fitting sclerals. We have no data. We have to throw a lens on and just completely eyeball it and guess. Okay? So scleral topography changes that completely. It's like going from having no data at all to having all the data we could possibly need to provide an optimal fit. So using scleral topography to immediately detects for us things like toricity, irregularity, how straightforward a fit is this going to be? Is it going to be a challenging fit? Am I going to need to use a toric fitting set or a spherical peripheral fitting set? Am I going to need to look at you know, other high, high end options for lens design because I have a very irregular eye? All that is immediately shown to us within moments of obtaining our data. Ultimately, again, what this is geared towards for all of us is not only providing better outcomes, but it's doing it faster, more efficient, saving the patients, the inconvenience of multiple lens applications, saving our office time. And so the, the minutes you spend obtaining spiral topographical data is saved multiple times over through the entire fitting process of that patient over the next several weeks of fitting process. So just briefly, for those of you who have not seen how the eye surface profiler works, it is a, a, does require a fluorescein installation into the eye. So we have the patient, uh, we enter all their data in the system, we position the patient in the instrument, line things up, have them sit back, apply lubricant, to help uh, stabilize the tear layer, just makes it easier to obtain good data. Uh, we instill fluorescein and we have the patient blink a few times and then we align them. And you see the grid that is projected on the eye, and this grid is what's going to give us our topographical data along with the fluorescein when it's reflected back. So we want the patient, we want the room to be as dim as we can, and typically we're going to help hold the lids apart. The wider we can hold the lids, the more data we're going to obtain. 
So it's, uh, it's something where we train our staff and students um, how to hold the lids properly. There are some little nuances that you learn over time as you get good at this that really help give you better data more efficiently. And that's something that can be discussed um, when we have all these instruments uh, we go through training how to do them. And so then once we've obtained our results, and, and again, with the eye surface profiler, it's quite easy to take multiple scans in just moments. So typically what I'll do is I'll have the patient's lids held apart, position, take a picture, let the patient blink once, reposition the lids, snap another image. We do that three, four, five images in a matter of seconds. So we have multiple images. And I tend to like to have the patient blink between each image because it kind of resets the surface layer. If I had a bad spot on my first image and I don't have them blink in between, I haven't done anything to fix the bad spot on my image. So we do a quick blink, reposition the lids, recapture, Again, three, four, five images takes literally just seconds to attain. And then our printout gives us an image such as this. And, and this is just the tip of the iceberg. The amount of data that's obtained here that you can look at some of these different menu options is extensive. Um, unless you're doing a lot of research and things like that, you may never look at some of the options that this instrument provides you for data. It's, it's quite amazing how much data it gives us about the ocular surface. We can uh, get corneal data as well, so this can work as a corneal topographer as well as a scleral topographer. So we get our outcome, and again, we can look at our map. If you're not familiar with scleral topography, we see a central corneal topography here that's on one um, reference sphere, and the scleral information is on a different reference sphere. That's why we see this transition of color that's abrupt right in the limbus. Typically, we're going to focus on the shape of the sclera out here because this is what's going to direct us towards the lens we want to try on, whether it's against spherical, toric in the periphery, what have you. So where we really want to go with this, of course, is we can obtain this data and we can look at this ourselves, and we can decide in our mind what we want to do. But can the software quickly, in a matter of seconds, do that for us? Can we obtain the data with the simple click of one button and have the instrument tell us this is the lens you need, as much detail as possible, so that I can essentially either just use one diagnostic lens to finish the fitting process and it's over, or even can I possibly have the instrument do the entire design, order me a lens, and know that it's going to be right the majority of the time. So this is what we, we love, of course, as practitioners, to be able to one click, have a lens design and done. So just as an example, and, and Karen's going to talk to you about her experiences in a minute. She's got a few cases to go over that are wonderful images you'll get to see on how this actually works. Um, but obviously, Karen works a lot with the pros in the Boston site. And um, my experience with lenses, I spend a lot more time working with that lens, and that's just my preference. It's one of the great things about Eye Surface Profiler is because it's not tied to a specific lab. There's many lens designs that are built into the system. And so you have the option of whatever your favorite lens is working with, most likely it's going to be available in the software to use that. So from, from what I'm going to talk about for the next few minutes is basically based upon one particular design, but this is relevant for any design that is built into the software. So we obtain our map, and then what we do is um, I will spend just a moment looking at the map and decide what type of lens I want to fit. And then I go to my menu and I simply choose that lens from the menu, click the button for that lens, and it prints out for me the parameters of the lens that I need to fit. Do you have a question? Possible uh, to save uh, my set, preferable. For example, different lens. Uh, I have special lens uh, in my fitting set. Can mm -hmm. I save it, sir? So if you have a, a lens design that you like to use that's not uh, built into the software? Just not APS-4, but APS-5, for example. Uh, well, let me go through how this works and let's see if you still have a question about it, okay? So again, what, what's going to happen is, is I'm going to choose the lens I want. So in this case, I chose a, a Zen RC, okay? The software, knowing my corneal diameter because it measures that, knowing the fitting guide is built in, selects the proper diameter lens based upon the lens that I want to fit. So it tells me I need a 15-4 diameter. It also then, measuring the sagittal height of the eye at 15.4, tells me I need the SAG of 4,000 lens. That will be the optimal depth lens to place on. It also is telling me that I need peripheral curves of four steps steep by two steps steep. Okay? 
So I can decide whether two steps of tericity is enough for me to place a toric lens or not. Um, if I were ordering it empirically, again, I could make that call myself. The next step could be then is to take this data, sorry that's so blurry, and um, choose this lens and pick that lens out of my fitting set, place it on the eye over a fract, get my final lens power, and then I can choose to simply go with what the instrument tells me for my peripheral curves, or I can put my diagnostic lens on and verify that I'm happy with what the instrument seems to be recommending for peripheral curves as well, and if I want to make any fine adjustments, I can. The point here is that I've placed one lens on the eye, I've spent literally moments actually looking at a lens with that patient, verifying the final power, and I'm done. So my fitting process for a bilateral fit, depending on how long you want the lens to sit on the eye, can take five or ten minutes of your time personally to get a bilateral fit complete. So one of the things that um, is exciting about the instrument that's fairly new, and if you have an instrument, you may not even have this option yet, but it's coming, it is something called Smart Merge. And so what can often happen is we can obtain multiple maps. As I said, we can snap off three, four, or five images and look at those images. And as we assess the quality of our images, we all know that there's some variability on any topographical map. Um, the Smart Merge software can take a map like this, where maybe I don't get as much data as I hoped I would with this particular scan, but I have multiple images that I've taken now, and I can pull multiple images and click a button, and the instrument will take those images and generate one image that maximizes my coverage and gives me the most complete and thorough data, utilizing multiple maps, merging them into a single map. So what this has allowed me to do now is get consistently 17, 17 and a half, 18 millimeters of data with this instrument off a single scan or off of a series of scans taken at one time without having to have multiple look up, look down, look left, look right, stitch them into one. I just take a bunch of individual scans and looking in one spot and the instrument will then merge them into a single optimal scan. And so again, we can take our maps, merge them, and then again, just like any other map, the smart merged map can become your map that you use for the fitting purposes. So again, what we're doing now is I'm using, uh, in all of my fitting, I'm doing a merge with the data first and using the ideal merged map to generate my lens parameters. And um, again, when we have compared multiple maps, we find that the merged data is very close to our individual maps. Um, but it does seem to uh, just again improve the, the quality and regularity and outcomes of our lenses. So again, the, the, the software is there for the lenses you want to design. You obtain your map. Again, if you feel like you want to take the, a moment to do a merge to get the best quality map for your lens design, you can take a moment to do that. Then you can have the instrument design your lens. Um, the outcomes again are great. What I want to talk about for the next couple minutes now is just some more research approach. And what we've been doing now over the last several months in Indiana, we've fitted about 100 eyes um, in uh, Zen lenses using the eye surface profiler. And we're, I want to talk to you about how accurate our outcomes have been with this instrument and so that you can understand the application practice. So the first thing that we wanted to do, this was several months ago, was um, we have our instrument, we're taking maps, and we have software that will tell us which lens to place on. So how accurate is it going to be at predicting the right sagittal height? Because most lenses, our fitting sets are ordered by sag. So I want to know which lens to put on. I want the first lens I put on to work every time. Can my lens or can my topographical data give me the right lens every time? Is it that accurate? Well, so what we found is that analyzing the first 60 eyes that were done, um, we uh, did an uh, eye surface profiler. We then chose the proper lens of the software that we want to fit. We placed it on the eye. We waited 10 minutes. And then we did an OCT measurement of central clearance on all 60 eyes. Well, we found the average vault in these 60 eyes came out at 10 minutes of 221 microns, which is a great place to be after 10 minutes on eye. Uh, the range was 321 down to 65, but only 5 out of 65 eyes had a vault that was either less than 100 or more than 300. 
So that means that 55 out of 60 times we have a lens that will work first time for all of our over fraction and analysis and, and data. So um, again, 55 out of 60 is a pretty high percentage of times when the lens, when the instrument was giving us the best first lens out of our fitting set. The next thing that we wanted to do was we wanted to take out of our own hands the uh, diameter selection. We wanted the instrument is measuring HVID anyway, so how accurate is the HVID measurement that the instrument obtains in order to drive us to the right lens diameter? And again, what we found was that in 58 out of 60 eyes, the HVID reading that the instrument obtained and then recommending lens diameter recommended the correct lens diameter. We validated this with other methods of measuring HVID. So again, 58 out of 60, pretty high. That means that we can trust the instrument is going to give us the right lens diameter when we choose to fit the software. More recently, we've been looking at whether the instrument can obtain accurate peripheral curve data. Can it not only tell us whether we need a toric or a sphere, but it can actually tell us exactly how steep each toric meridian is. And if we allow the instrument to do the complete lens design, how accurate is it going to be? So at this point, uh, we've only analyzed 14 eyes of our group. So we are continuing to order lenses for patients using completely empirically designed lenses to see how accurate they are. Um, again, in every case, the instrument has been accurate at recommending whether a spherical peripheral curve or toric is the best option. And in every case that we've done so far, when we've analyzed the lens that was ordered, that was designed by the instrument, ordered, placed on eye, allowed to settle, we have not had to adjust either meridian, steep or flat meridian, by more than 60 microns. So that we're accurate to within two steps with Z-Lens on both meridians. Again, um, in every case that allowed us to have 100% of our lenses that were ordered empirically were dispensable. What that means to me is that when I looked at the fit, there was nothing about that lens that said that that patient couldn't walk out with it today. That means that there were no cases where the lens was bearing on the cornea or had significant edge lift or anything that made it a non-dispensable lens. Now, we did have a few patients who said, well, I can feel the lens a little bit here and there. And so we had um, two of our eight patients that we fitted lenses on that felt like they would prefer to have the lens adjusted prior to dispensing. But the other six out of eight patients were perfectly happy with these lenses to walk out Comfort rating on a scale of 1 to 10 on average was over 8 with a, a, the lens that was designed by the instrument. So, and what I've found so far in using the instrument uh, to design lenses is that the main thing I'm doing is I'm adjusting the peripheral curves just slightly. I'm usually steepening them by just a step or two. And that may just be my fitting uh, protocol, the way I like to see my lenses fit. Uh, but again, in every case, the lenses are dispensable at follow up. I find myself just adjusting the peripheral curves a little bit on the steeper side. Um, only twice, uh, two out of 16 lenses, did we adjust the sag reading at all. Otherwise, the other 14 out of 16, we left the sag exactly as designed. So, where are we at with the eye surface profiler and fitting the lenses? I think it's pretty clear that the data that we get is accurate and useful in designing lenses. How is the instrument at designing lenses for us? I think it's, it's actually very accurate that we can trust that we're going to get dispensable lenses nearly every time, that we can, in a matter of moments, we can find a diagnostic lens, over a frac, come up with the final power, follow what the instrument recommends for a lens is going to work, again, the vast majority of the time. It's going to save us a lot of chair time. We do continue to look at our outcomes, and I'll be working with Eaglet to continue to look at outcomes with lens design and improve our fitting nomograms if at all possible. So as I said, we had a couple patients where we found ourselves a little flat. That's something we'll continue to work on so that your outcomes when you use this instrument to design your lenses are going to be better and better all the time. So I'm going to turn this over to Karen. She's going to talk about some cases where they've used the instrument as well to design lenses.
um, as Barney introduced um, the lecture. So I'm going to be sharing with you the experience that we have had at Boston site working with the Eaglet in this first fit lens algorithm, in particular seeing the application that this um, spiral topographer can have for large diameters. Um, one of the things that we are mainly interested in in partnering with Eaglet was to see whether we can you know, work with an instrument that can scan all the way out to 20 millimeters of that entire cross surface and see if we can come up with this first fit lens algorithm. So I'm going to discuss, some of you may have seen some of these cases if you came to the Boston Tide breakout, so I apologize in advance for that. But, um, so I'm going to start with this uh, first case. This is a 62-year-old male, carrying homeless patient, um, post intax and cross-linking in the left eye, that came to us for a consultation because um, he was having some um, problems with previous scleral lens uh, fittings. Um, they were tight, there was some poor comfort, and limited ability to wear the lenses. Um, the vision was 20-40 at the time. So we decided, okay, let's um, try to get an image. Uh, we scanned the eye, and in this case, we went all the way to 17 uh, millimeter um, on the front surface. And what we did is, once we acquired uh, this 3D image, high um, image, we, um, as Jason um, discussed, the software, if your lens design is, the algorithm is in the software, you just choose the lens that you want to work with, and you click calculate. And that's as simple as that. And the software is going to predict and tell you what is it that you need to order. In this case, working with Boston Site Lenses, it tells you what SAG you need to uh, choose, the change in SAG, what base curve, because that controls the peripheral point of clearance in order to achieve minimal clearance, or minimal to minimal clearance, and specifically what changes in microns you need to add to each of the quadrants in a quadrant-specific manner, because that's the design that we work with in Boston Site. So getting that data, we just send that data straight to the lab, to the lake, cut a lens, and this is the outcome. First lens, we apply in the eye. This is an 18.5 millimeter lens, and you can see that it's well aligned. Um, this was a completely image-guided fit. The vision improved 2025 to from 2040. This is uh, using front surface eccentricity. In this case, it was full clearance, no cylindus, no compression, and the patient, just from one dispense, is wearing the lens for 12 hours a day. The next case is a 33-year-old male, um, history of PRK, and he's already used to us wearing spiral lenses. He's successfully wearing spiral lenses in the left eye. The patient is comfortable, but in, in this particular case, he wanted to come see us because even though he he enters with 20-20 vision in the right eye. He's experiencing a significant amount of ghosting and glare, which is very uh, limiting to him at nighttime. So with the choice of front surface eccentricity that we um, have available in our designs, we were able to improve the vision and decided to proceed with fitting only in the right eye, in this particular case, to improve vision. So because we had this patient come in, we took an eaglet image, we, we scan both eyes, but we proceed just to take um, an image again. This is 17 millimeters of the uh, front surface. We hit calculate, and the software predicts what is it that we need. In this case, we're able to improve the vision to 2015. Um, from 2020, and more importantly for him was the quality of vision, but this was a first lens um, that we obtained for the patient, and the patient's very comfortable. This case is a 48-year-old male. Um, post PKP from keratoconus. Um, and again, these patients that we see usually have been wearing some other modalities. Um, we're not their first stop, um, and that's when they come to see us. And so it was, there was some intolerance, so we were doing a fit, um, a new fit, to improve the fit. We obtained the scans in both eyes, and again, we send it to the lake, one fit and done. And you can see it's well centered. This is a large diameter lens. Navigating that spiral shape at touristy, and we can achieve a center lens aligned, no compression, no impingement, and the patient is comfortable. 
And the last case that I'll share with you is um, a dry eye patient, a female with dry eye. And in this case, we're able to get a pretty uh, good image, almost um, 19 uh, millimeters out um, in both eyes. And we fitted this patient with 18.5 millimeter lenses. This is, again, a first fit lens algorithm. You can see um, this is a, compos a composite um, of each um, uh, gaze. So um, unfortunately, you couldn't get one um, single image, but you can see it's centered, and there's no um, impingement or compression. This is the image for the left eye. This particular patient um, was very compliant, so we said, because we had the scan, we said, you know, let's take, we, this is the fit that we proceeded with, 18.5. But then we took the right eye and said, let's just with that one image, cut a lens in an 18 millimeter. And with that one image, let's cut a 19 millimeter lens to see if, you know, what this software can do as far as different diameters and see what's the outcome. So we cut the 18 millimeters from that lens, from that one scan, send it to the lab, and this is how the 18 um, looks in the eye. You can see, again, well aligned, the patient's very comfortable. And this is the 19 millimeter lens, just with that one scan. So what this is showing to us is that this software, if you get a good um, reading, and that's something that Eaglet um, people will come and train you at your office in how to acquire a good image. You can actually get um, good outcomes, and this is regardless of diameter. Jason has just shared his experience working with the salmons, which is 17, or what diameter are you working with? Between 15 and 17. 15 and 17, and here I'm giving you data from 18 to 19. So this is something for you to consider and have options. So with that, I'm going to leave it to Arnie. Yeah. To close it up, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thanks, uh, thanks for your uh, presentations. Thank you, Dr. Carrasquillo. I'm afraid we are out of time, so uh, we don't have time for questions, but we will be at the lunch. We'll be at booth 108. Uh, instrument aided fitting, for sure, will be the future in the next uh, couple of years. It will completely take over. And we kindly invite you to consider the eye surface profile for your practice. Come to us. We'll, uh, we'll be very happy to explain all the details. Thank you so much for coming. <coughs>